Good morning, everyone, and uh, good morning, witnesses also. I welcome you to the 12th meeting of the Social Security Committee 2017. Can I remind everyone to turn off their mobile phones or si silent mode, as it does uh, disrupt the meeting. Apologies have been received from Mark Griffin, and I welcome Richard Leonard, who is substitute for the committee. Uh, can I also let the committee know that we will be observing a minute silence at 11am, uh, as will others in the building, uh, to mark the tragic events in Manchester. Our first ag agenda item is agenda item one, decision and taking matters in private. First item today, item three, would that be OK to take it in private committee? Thank you. Uh, agenda item two is two child tax credits. Um, we have two panel witnesses here today. Uh, before we start, I really would like to thank everyone for the submissions they sent in. They were very thorough and uh, thank you uh, all very much. We also received uh, the letter which had been copied into us as well, mentioned by uh, Rape Crisis Scotland in Gender and Scottish Women's Aid. And thank you very much for that. The first panel who given evidence today are Rob Gowns, Policy Officer, Citizens Advice Scotland, Emma Rich, Executive Director in Gender, and Joe Osga, uh, Policy Worker, Scottish Women's Aid. Uh, I'll open the discussion up by asking the first question. Uh, I do note from the submissions and I'm sure other members will be asking further questions, that the child tax credit is an area which basically fills your, your time. People come in and ask most questions about child tax credits uh, when they're seeking advice. Can I therefore ask, uh, with the introduction of the two child cap, if you have indeed seen an increase in people inquiring, and also how you perceive this uh, legislation which is going forward will affect your clients, and I'll open it up to whoever. Yeah, I mean, uh, in terms of um, um, child tax credits is one of the most common things that people will, will seek advice on or be given advice on. Um, it's around sort of 13,300 um, sort of cases in the last year. Um, in terms of since the introduction, because it's only been um, been six weeks and because it's only affecting children who were um, born after the, the 6th of April, there hasn't been a huge, huge spike. Um, what we'd expect to see is, is a sort of a gradual, a gradual increase over time as, as more sort of the children um, are born and, and people will, will come in for advice about, about that. Thank you. You open up to George. Yes, thank you. Um, well, we, our concern is obviously for women who are experiencing domestic abuse and the, the, the importance of um, social security as a safety net for women when they leave an abusive partner. Um, the sort of evidence that we've submitted highlights the impact of the cuts to social security on women, particularly lone parents, the majority of whom are women. Um, and we see this, um, the two child limit as, as going to further impoverish women, which then limits their capacity to for action, um, their ability to make choices, their ability to leave an abusive partner. Um, I think for women, the two-child limit, if, if they're having a third child, and I think the case study that we submitted um, for the, from the woman that's currently receiving support from one of our women's aid organisations, where she's working part-time as a cleaner, on very insecure uh, contract, is currently pregnant, has ill health um, as a result of the <coughs> domestic abuse she's experienced, is a really typical example of the woman that women's aid works with and will really um, affect women in that situation in terms of can they make that move to leave an abusive partner or not, and they'll have to weigh that up really carefully. Um, and it also reinforces the messages that women get from an abusive partner, that they're not of equal value, that they won't be able to manage on their own, that their children will suffer as a result of, of them um, leaving that partner. <coughs> 
Um, we, we don't have service users, um, as in gender as a policy and advocacy organisation, but um, along with a whole range of women's organisations, we've been doing work um, to test some of the ideas around the proposed social security um, changes and the use of the new powers in Scotland. Um, and women are deeply concerned by the introduction of the two-child limit, um, extremely horrified by the notion of the rape clause and the other exemptions, um, but also um, just how have a, a strong sense that this is a signal um, from the UK government that women who are living with poverty should not be having more than two children, and um, that the same choices about um, how to plan their lives and their families are, are therefore um, not open in the same way and not supported um, by UK government, which I think is a profoundly stigmatising um, message to send through the social security system. Thank you. And just to follow up slightly on that, because I know other members want to come in, when it's obviously, you know, child tax credit is to top up. So basically, in your opinion, if you're going to have three children and you're having to produce this later, if you're going forward for any other types of benefits, would you perceive that people have to produce a letter as well? How will it have the knock-on effect if you're, most of the people are working? Actually, you know, the working families are not uh, on benefits per se. Will that have a knock-on effect for any other aspect of the welfare system for, for these women? That's a good question, and I think that's something around which we're still unclear. So um, the letter that um, uh, Rape Crisis Scotland and Gender and Scottish Women's Aid sent to Damien Hines, the um, UK Minister um, for Employment, asked um, 10 quite broad questions about the way that information will be gathered and will be stored, and then how... Um, how it will be signified in communications that may need to be shown to other agencies. Um, there's been some concern um, among England-based organisations that when parents are making applications for free school meals, um, they will require to show a letter that may be coded in such a way um, that makes it clear that a child has been conceived as a result of um, rape and so are desperately concerned about the potential breach to privacy and dignity of the child and of um, the mother that that would entail, but that the, the implementation of the rape clause has been extremely um, opaque, and so um, the reason we have written to uh, the minister is to seek urgent clarification on a range of questions that women are, are certainly posing to us. I don't know if Jo has... Yeah, I mean, I think the, the letter sort of spells out a lot of our concerns about how will that information be used um, if women were to choose to complete that form, which I think is questionable. Um, and also the lack of privacy. Um, I think, as Emma said, if you're applying for a school clothing grant and you have to provide proof of income, there's only a few reasons why you, or a couple of reasons why you would be receiving um, tax credits for three children. And so how will that information be protected and um, I think that's one of the key questions that we have. Rob, sorry if you want to take a minute now. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's, um, see, there's sort of losing entitlement to, to tax credits will will result in a, in a loss of income. Um, we've seen from um, previous changes in, in 2012, um, caught a bit of a glimpse with the, um, the issues around concentrics and people's tax credits being stopped, how much of an impact um, tax credits has on on family incomes, um, that um, that people be driven further into into hardship. In terms of the the kind of the technical um, interplay between the between the benefits, there's um, it, may, it may it may have an effect on on sort of people's entitlements to um, to other benefits, but. Um, um, Need to sort of need go through, I suppose, particular particular cases to see if there was a a, a change of in of entitlement. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's um, it's something that may may have a sort of an impact on on sort of wider things. And Alison Johnson, you wanted to come in. Um, yeah, thank you, convener. Um, thank you, panel, and particularly for some you know very informative written submissions. Um, uh, I note from the submissions that there will be a particular impact, the, the two-child limit, um, on religious communities, on lone parents, the majority of whom are women, on black and minority ethnic communities. Um, and 
I'm just concerned about the evidence base for this policy. Um, it very much seems to come from a, a view that those who claim child tax credits should, as you've said, be, have to be subject to the same financial decisions as those who can't claim it. But as has already been noted, um, most people who are claiming tax credits are working, 69%, and there are two parents in the home, 64%. So do you think there are any weaknesses in the way this policy has been justified? Yes. Um, yes, I think I think you have um, put your finger on a number of weaknesses um, in, in the development of the policy. Um, I think our analysis of the statements that the UK government has made um, throughout the development of um, the two-child limit, but then the exemptions, um, has been that there has been very little clarity about the underlying thinking behind the policy, about the evidence base for the policy, and certainly a failure to impact assess the policy. Um, and the, um, the, the UK government is required, as all public bodies are, to undertake equality the impact assessment required by the Equality Act 2010. Um, the Equality and Human Rights Commission has also written to Damien Hines to say that they do not feel that this has happened and therefore the impact on those communities that you enumerate, um, women, black and minority ethnic people, people from religious communities, um, ha has not been captured. But I think more fundamentally, there is not an evidence base that has been um, shown to the public to explain why the UK government would think this would incentivise families to behave in a different way. Um, there is one very brief reference to some work that IFS has done in the impact assessment um, published on the um, entirety of the Welfare Reform and Work Act, um, and that does not amount to a convincing case to suggest that reducing um, tax credits will encourage families to make different choices about the number of children that they have. And I think common sense would tell us that if you can claim child tax credits up until the age of um, your child being 20, uh, that people do not have a crystal ball to see into the future. And so bereavement, illness, disability, um, family breakdown, um, blending your family with that of another person, um, all of these things are not um, predicted by people, but we know that they happen to millions of families across the UK. So um, to compound the weakness of the argument for doing it in the first place um, comes the, I think, additional indignity that the needs of communities which are protected by law, um, including women, have just not been considered adequately in the development of this policy. Thank you. Would anyone else like to comment? Um, yeah, I think um, there's um, a range of situations where um, um, people who um, are not claiming tax credits at the time their child is born subsequently will, will need to claim tax credits if, if a family breaks up, um, if people fall ill, um, if someone's made redundant, for instance. Um, so it's not necessarily the case that at the time the sort of child was sort of planned, conceived or born, that um, people would um, would either realise or, or predict that they would need tax credits at some point in the next in the next few years. Um, these um, you mentioned there was um, it's got quite a particular impact. Lone parents, in particular, um, up on lone parents who who would have three or more more children, um, and it's sort of affected by by sort of other changes to to the social security system. Um, you know, from the official figures published that since the the reduction in the benefit cap, that um, the 57 percent of um, people, households affected in Scotland are lone parents with three or more children. Um, so a bit of concern that there will be somewhat of a, of a double whammy between, um, between the benefit cap, um, between the changes to the tax credit system, um, and to other social security changes coming in, such as the, um, the changes to employment support allowance and the, the reduction for uh, the removal of the family element in, in tax credits as well, um, will have quite a, um, a significant squeeze on um, sort of family incomes for people with, with three or more children. Yeah, I think also for, for the women that we are working with and supporting, um, it's, it's an assumption that um, the two-child limit assumes equal control over um, in different families and, um, on making such decisions about whether to have children or not. 
and for many women who are experiencing domestic abuse, sexual violence and rape as a component of that domestic, of their experience of domestic abuse is really common. So women don't have control over um, their reproductive rights. So, excuse me. Did you want to come back in again, Alison? Yeah, yeah. On, you know, the, you've spoken about rights um, quite a lot in your responses. I'd just like to understand your thoughts regarding the impact of the two-child limit um, and the rape clause on the rights of the child and the rights of the mother. I think it's fair to say that there's been some disagreement, even in the chamber here, over what the claimant has to do to prove non-consensual conception. Um, and the Conservative leader actually said, and I'm quoting from the official report, uh, the woman writes her name and a third party professional who is helping her sets out the rest. Um, others have said this isn't accurate and as far as I'm aware at the moment there are no third party referees confirmed in Scotland. No one is willing to undertake this, uh, you know, just to be involved in such a, such a dreadful situation. So can I ask you to give your committee to give the committee your view on the impact on the rights of the woman and the child and what actually has to happen? Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to start. Um, I think um, it's, it, it's, it's an, the exemption raises serious doubts about the, about the rights of the woman and the child. Um, I think it contravenes um, women's and children's rights to privacy. Um, the forum itself does require a lot more than the woman just signing, uh, putting her name on a form <clears throat> and signing it. Um, she has to write her own name, she has to write the name of the child that, um, and sign to say that she believes that that child was uh, conceived as a result of rape. Um, the form has um, at the top of it a really large font um, which says that uh, it's a form that you're filling in to say that your child has been conceived as a result of uh, coercion or rape, um, which we believe would be extremely distressing for women to, um, to even consider um, doing. And we know from our work and the work of Rape Crisis Scotland how re traumatising um, that having to contemplate um, filling in a form to say that your child has been conceived as a result of rape would be for women um, at a time not of their choosing to do so um, and having no control of what, over what might happen to that information. So we agree with the Equality and Human Rights uh, Commission who wrote to the Minister to say that, that, that in their view that the invasive reporting requirements of intimate details um, was penalising women um, and also um, was the real issue for women of their child perhaps potentially finding out that they were conceived as a result of rape. And we know that women will go to huge lengths, that's the last thing they want their child to know was that they were conceived as a result of rape. And we know that you know, 80 psychologists, clinical psychologists have written to the minister as well, outlining their concerns about the impact that this would have on women um, and also on children um, because they work um, to support children who have found out that they've been conceived as a result of rape and how traumatising that can be for children. In that particular yes, one. Please, yeah. O on the point about um, third party referrers, um, we are not aware of any organisation that has agreed to be a third party referrer in Scotland. Um, the DWP has a list of organisations under the Survivors Trust umbrella, which is a, um, an umbrella membership body for organisations that work with um, women who've experienced um, violence against women. And um, they have. They have um, produced a kind of blanket membership list, but from our discussions with the individual members on that list, none we've spoken to has affirmatively agreed to be a third party referrer. So one of the questions we have asked um, the minister is what, how can this be implemented in Scotland, um, given that circumstance and given the communication from the Cabinet Secretary for Health that NHS staff will not be participating um, as it's a, a breach of, um, they believe, their professional ethics um, given human rights concerns. Um, I think the uh, House of Lords, when the um, post-legislative scrutiny committee looked at this question, um, looked at the two statutory instruments which kind of framed what's now colloquially been known as the rape clause, um, they also asked a question about um, 
appeals and how an appeals process would work because um, the, the DWP has articulated that, that because of the third party referrers, DWP staff themselves will not be involved in, in making any deliberations and won't have access to this um, sensitive information. <coughs> Um, the, the response that the um, DWP made to the House of Lords was that the, the usual appeals process would be would apply in this circumstance, and therefore um, DWP staff would have access to the most um, sensitive information, the contents of the disclosure, if there was any question about the veracity of it. Fair enough. Mm. Thank you. Paul, I mean, you wanted to come in in a supplementary on this particular yeah, was, There's a follow-up um, to your answer to Alison Johnson on the quality impact assessment. Um, so you mentioned specifically minority ethnic communities. Now, of course, we're talking about um, from April of this year, so we don't really yet have... You know, we do, we do, I don't know what assumptions we're, we're making, but um, have you had any discussion with any organisations in the minority ethnic community and... To my knowledge, no one's raised the issue, or I don't know if that's what you're alluding to, the Catholic community, of which I am one, um, and who tend to have big families, or did in the past, um, and depends on your view of, um, of what doctrine of the church you follow, but many women don't, uh, will follow the doctrine of the church um, but by not using contraception. And I wondered if that point had been... I mean, do you have any figures, for example, on the size of families... Um, in the communities that you're talking about, and have you had any discussions uh, with the churches and the groups you're talking about? So the, the churches and many faith-based um, community representative organisations made strong representations to the DWP during the formulation of this policy um, based exactly on the concerns that the member raised. We also, in our submission to the consultation, which happened in November 2016, um, the DWP consulted on the implementation um, of the exempt exceptions um, for a period of one month. So we um, submitted, as others did, um, evidence that outlined the issue for um, black and minority ethnic um, communities, faith-based communities, and others who would not necessarily want to either access contraception or terminate pregnancies um, that arose um, when they already had two children. Um, there, there is a question about the, the evidence base on which the government is acting in this regard, and one of the questions that we have put to the minister is, how many terminations do you expect to arise as a result of this policy? Um, because it seems to us, without a clear equality impact assessment uh, and without a clear um, publication of any evidence or thinking on the part of UK government, um, that they are indeed expecting that women will... Um, terminate pregnancies that arise when they already have two children. And I think that's insupportable given the attitudes that you outline of some um, religious and other communities to that particular medical practice. Um, interestingly to us, the uh, UK government did not adopt the exception which is widely used in the case of American um, family caps. And this policy has very much been copied wholesale from uh, those introduced in 90s Clinton um, so-called welfare reform um, moves. Um, by It doesn't include an exception for the instances where um, long-acting reversible contraception has failed. Um, so in America, that was very much the case, that if you, um, if you used um, an IUD or an implant and that did not work to prevent pregnancy, then you would also receive an exception. Um, that very question was put by the House of Lords to the DWP, um, who came back and said, we really need something which is easy to prove, and so we're content with the exceptions as, as, they, as they stand, um, which I think is quite inconsistent um, as a position about, um, as a position about um, inducing um, a, a, 
thinking in families about the number of children that they can afford. Um, as to your question about have we spoken to um, black minority ethnic organisations, yes, and they are members of um, Rip Crosses Scotland and Scottish Women's Aid um, have specifically um, BME service provision organisations um, that have contributed to the, the position of the, their umbrella organisations. Um, and in terms of the churches, we have just drawn on the written material they've produced in, in response to, to these policies. So, Ben McPherson, do you want to come in on a supple on that particular one? Adam Tompkins, do you want to come in on a supplementary as well? I, I was interested in the, the, the comparisons that Engender drew among the American case studies, and I don't know if there's any other points that you, you want to draw out on that, particularly the fact that the the family cap didn't change behaviour and um, actually pushed people further into poverty. And I think, associating myself with the, 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 the premises behind Alison Johnson's question, I think it's important to re remember that this policy will affect a huge amount of people who are in work. And, and given the research from Cardiff University that came out this week that 60 per cent of, of families in poverty are, are, are in work, I think this policy it's important to remember that, that where this policy sits in terms of the social economic makeup of, of the UK. I also, um, if, you, if you don't mind, convener, because the, 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 the American question has been raised, as well as uh, information on the American question, there, uh, the, 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 I would just like to drill a little bit harder into the, a little bit more into the, the point that was raised earlier about changing circumstances, because I think that's. Uh, particularly from from women's aid, I know you've you've said before that, that, that the policy ignores real life when contraception fails or when there's unemployment or, or ill health, and I, I think it, it would be good for all of us to understand what, what your feeling is on the ground around around those issues and, and how this policy is and, and can affect. And with with Cass as well, although. The statement was rightly made earlier that this will apply to new claimants. It's, is, is it not important to rem remember that, particularly given the point I made earlier about families being in work, if insecure work is part of that, then people will be falling in and out of the labour market, and then so people who are, are receiving tax credits at the moment may need to, to reapply in future, and that will have a, an impact in terms of this, this uh, family cap policy. That offers. Do you want to say something? Um, so the question um, that you raise about engender and the, the US evidence, um, I mean, I would be clear that we are not experts on the US experience, but we did a um, brief literature review when we were um, pulling together a response to the consultation and looking around for examples of where this had or had not functioned um, internationally. Uh, the findings within the American context, and, and many states have had family caps in operation since the 90s, has been that they have um, not at all really affected the number of children born into families. Um, they've slightly increased the rate of um, pregnancy terminations where state funding was available for um, those medical procedures, um, and they have substantially impoverished um, women, principally lone parents, um, who were subject to those family caps. Um, and although the, the, the context is slightly different because they were principally applied to the types of social security um, payments received by people not in paid work, um, they have um, had an effect of uh, making it so that women could not afford um, such things as nappies, um, food for their children, um, housing costs, so really have profoundly impacted on um, women's um, security and dignity and an adequate standard of living um, and really um, acted against children's rights. Um, and in Scotland, we uh, are trying to realise the, the, the ambitions of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Um, everything that goes into the Committee uh, on the Rights of the Child emphasises that social security payments to parents um, is a fundamental part of ensuring that children have an adequate standard of living. Want to give in this particular um, Yes, yeah, it's just, um, Reef and um, OCB um, 
be something that, as you mentioned, um, the um, we'll see sort of a growing a growing impact of the policy. Sort of just sort of doing a bit of um, sort of rough calculations on the on the um, the number of births in Scotland. There's probably been a, a, just over seven thousand um, children born um, since the um, since the start of April. Um, so it's it's not a, a, a sort of a huge amount that would be affected by. Um, by the policy as yet, but there's there's something like around um, sort of 150 children born um, born every day in Scotland. Um, so um, we start to see numbers numbers growing of of people who will have a third child and then um, seek advice on a um, on how they can maximise their incomes. Um, um, that's um, through sort of claiming um, tax credits or, or not. Um, so there will quite a, quite a large amount of advice that we that we give is about making claims for for, um, for child tax credits for universal credit for people who are um, who are either sort of in work it could be in um, in precarious or insecure work or um, end of work um, but basically need need support to um, to pay um, pay basic basic living costs. Um, so, I think it, it's going to be be something that the the impact may be may be slightly unpredictable in the extent that we we don't necessarily know um, uh, what's going to to happen in in people's lives. Um, but also, um, people will will need support from um, from tax credits, from universal credit in future, and um, won't be able to get the. The additional support that would that would come from a um, for a third child. You want to come in that one, then Adam Tomkins wants to come in. Briefly, I think to supplement what um, Emma said about the evidence from the United States, um, we also looked at and did a quick literature review um, and really to find out how that worked for women who were experiencing domestic abuse and uh, and there's been some, some significant amount of research done um, about the impact for, for women in that situation and their the entrapment that that um, resulted um, because of women not being able to access sufficient social security to be able to to um, begin to rebuild their lives and to take care of their children but they also did have similar sort of domestic violence waivers exemptions um, for women in that situation and there was found that these were largely unused um, because women didn't trust the welfare agency um, 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 and felt you know, shame and humiliation in having to use these in order to get social security um, for their children. Um, and that, that, that also the privacy deprivations from that sort of process meant that they didn't then go on and access other forms of assistance and support. So actually further impoverished them and their children because they they sort of began to slip out of the system altogether um, and that was a real concern in terms of the women and children's health as to what um, happened as a result of that. And we also know from our, our you know, the work, I've done quite a lot of work recently with women that, um, researching their own experiences, um, both of homelessness and of the impact of social security reform on their ability to rebuild their lives when, when they become lone parents, um, following a relationship separation as a result of domestic abuse. And they're often, because of their circumstances, um, where they've been prevented from working or they've been primary caregivers for their children for long periods of time, it's really difficult for, the, for them to access well-paid employment. Um, so they're often ending up in low-paid, insecure um, jobs where they need tax credits to supplement their income in order to be able to um, retain their independence. Um, and what we're beginning to see from some women's aid support workers is that um, when women are coming for an, in an initial assessment, looking for support, or maybe have been brought there by the police or social work, um, and looking at what their entitlements will be to um, social security support. Um, they often don't see these women again because they're, they, they're, they're having to weigh up how they're going to manage to support themselves and their children um, in these circumstances. And, it's, um, and that's really a huge concern to us. And we've fed in evidence recently to the Equality and Human Rights Committee for their destitution inquiry on the destitution of many women that we're seeing now. Um, 
in these circumstances. An increase in, in occurrences of what you just described in, in we, recent weeks. I mean, weeks it's a lot of it's anecdotal. We're gathering case studies and doing focus <coughs> groups with women. But yes, certainly, I, and that's been my experience in, in working with groups of women who've got direct experience of these issues. Is that that's that's what they're saying, and that's what they're struggling to come to terms with when they're you know being encouraged to seek support that they shouldn't be living with domestic abuse. But the reality of then their lives afterwards, as lot, particularly women with children, is, you know, leaves them with a real sense of injustice. And this, is, this, this is why their, their lives have ended up, and they often describe it as a real struggle. You know, they, just, they don't see a way out of the situation that they're in. Thank you. Adam Tonkin, do you want to come in with a supplementary? Yeah, thank you. I, I did want to ask a couple of supplementaries arising out of the um, questions that Alison Johnson was asking a, a little while ago. Thank you very much for your very powerful evidence. The, the, the case that you make um, against the uh, uh, two-child cap um, is a case that, um, that makes it sound to my ears very much like this is a policy which is illegal. Um, the arguments that you make about um, contravention of the Equality Act, the, argument that you make, the arguments that you make um, about um, privacy concerns and data protection concerns um, are not just political points. Uh, in, in which you know you are arguing that the policy is unwise or inappropriate, there are legal points in which you are arguing that the policy is um, uh, unlawful. So my qu my qu first question arising out of um, uh, what you've said so far is: What action are your um, organisations uh, taking or proposing to take to challenge these policies in the courts, either in Scotland or in England? That particular one first. Emma? Um, I think we are considering our options in that regard. Why, why wait? Mr Tompkins, if you'd just let the witness maybe come in without... Jo, did you want to come back in on that one no, as well? I think I would agree with um, what Emma said. I think our first response has been to write for, for asking for much more detailed information from the minister on, on how the issues that we're concerned about will be addressed. And I think, as um, Citizens Advice have said, the policy is relatively new. We, I mean, I think if you're in, you, you would need to look, in terms of looking for evidence or um, of taking any further action, you need to, that needs to be developed. Do you want to come back in with your other supplementary? Does, or? Does, 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 do want oh, sorry, to drop one. I don't know if Rob um, wants to give it in that one. I mean, it's, um, we don't tend to bring test cases, though, aware that there's, there's, sort of, um, there's other organisations who are, who are looking at, at whether it's possible to, um, to sort of bring, a, bring a legal challenge, but I, I think it would be, it'd be something that, that Citizens Advice Scotland would... Um, would necessarily initiate. I see. Okay, thank you. Um, I mean, the reason why I ask that question is just because, you know, over the course of the last decade or more, um, you know, legal actions taken in the courts have been a very successful means of putting brakes on um, uh, policies, including welfare reform policies, uh, that groups such as the ones that you work with um, uh, have thought to be, you know, contrary to basic provisions of the equality legislation or basic provisions of um, uh, data protection or, 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 um, or, or privacy uh, law. So I think it's a useful you know, avenue uh, for you and your organisations all, um, all to be thinking about. The second question, Convener, if I may, was, is this. That, um, it seems to me also that, that the, that the, that the two-child uh, cap on tax credits is a, is a test um, of something that was very important um, to the Smith Commission of which I was a member. Um, and what the Smith Commission did um, was to um, agree that a whole range of welfare benefits should be devolved in full uh, to this parliament, and that, in addition, the um, Scottish parliament would have the power to top up any reserved benefit. The idea being uh, that the United Kingdom would set the floor and this parliament would not have the power to um, uh, um, lower that floor, but the United Kingdom would not set the ceiling. And if this Parliament thought that the floor had been set too low, 
by the United Kingdom, we would have the power in this Parliament uh, to um, top up any reserve benefit, whether it's within devolved, whether it would otherwise have been within devolved competence or, or not. Um, and of, there has, of course, been a vote in this Parliament, 91 to 31, that says that this floor has been set too low. So my question is, what, um, uh, what pressure are you bringing to bear on the Scottish Government to exercise its powers to ensure that none of these issues that you're talking about apply in Scotland at all, given that we have the power to do something about that? For that question, Emma. Sure. Yeah. Um, thank you for your advice about pursuing strategic litigation. Um, the. The question about mitigation, um, I think, is quite an interesting one for our organisations. Um, and in terms of pressure to bear, I think I would echo Joe's points about there being a lot of discussion with UK government still to run on this question about um, whether ultimately the two-child limit and its exemptions will be seen to be a useful policy. Um, I think that the, there are a number of questions raised by the Equality and Human Rights Commission and by our organisations um, that I think we are still at, at the discussion stage of. Um, and I think the most charitable interpretation is that perhaps um, because of a lack of equality impact assessment, some of these issues simply haven't yet been considered um, by UK government. So we are certainly not at the end of the process um, of determining what is going to happen to the two-child limit. Um, so the question for our organisation then, which has been um, very much involved and engaged with Scottish Government in the um, development of uh, the new social security powers, is what is ultimately best for women's equality? Um, and I think we would want to consider that question in the round, undertaking adequate equality impact assessment, um, using gender mainstreaming approaches, uh, and pursuing the principles of dignity and fairness and human rights, which the um, Scottish Minister for Social Security has indicated will be part of development. So um, the, the short answer is that we have not yet determined whether it is um, in most in women's interests and the interests of women's equality um, to propose that mitigation of the specific policy is the most useful avenue, or if actually a different decision um, with regards to the use of Scottish social security powers and the budgets thereof would be most in women's interests. Um, and that will obviously require some modelling, perhaps, um, but also a clearer sense of um, the content of what will, will be in the Social Security um, Bill, which will be forthcoming quite soon. So um, we will continue to have those discussions and continue to push for women's equality and rights to be realised through the implementation of Social Security powers in Scotland. Okay. I mean, do you want to come in on that one, Joe? I've got three people want to come in on a supplementary. No, I think that's... that's OK. Did you want um, to come in on that one, Rob? Yeah, I think just basically the, um, we would welcome Buster James's whether whether the UK government were to, were to make them or to the, whether the Scottish government were to, to mitigate them. There's obviously... Um, sort of our priority is that, um, that it's as simple and straightforward for people to, to claim... The benefits they're entitled to as it possibly can be um, in mitigating the um, mitigating policies as we've seen with um, you know, schemes around um, the bedroom tax and around the um, the removal of, of housing support for 18 to 21 year olds there's I suppose a, it's 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 it tends to be sort of necessarily quite um, quite complicated and not as and not as straightforward as as not applying the um, the policy in the first place would would be. Um, but that being said, if if, um, if the sort of the, the sort of Scottish government were willing to um, to make changes, then then we would welcome that. Got three supplementaries to that one: Ben McPherson, Gordon Linters, and George Adam. Just very quick, sure. very quickly, convener. Given the the potential cost of a, a judicial review to, to third parties, uh, third sector organisations like yourself. <laughs> Um, and, and given the uh, potential cost on, on in, any uh, Scottish government on, in terms of mitigation, shouldn't the focus remain right now on this policy at source? And given there's a general election going on at the moment, shouldn't we all be putting pressure 
on the UK government uh, in, in, in the coming weeks and, and continue to do so going forward to uh, bring uh, to abolish this policy at source, this, this policy that's not, as Adam said, has been voted against in Scotland, or, or at least to, to, to think about a geographical exclusion. Anyone want to pick up on that particular one before I bring the next? I mean, yeah, absolutely. I think if the if the policy can be um, amended, and I mean the two child limit here can be um, amended, changed, or removed, that would ultimately be of most use, I think, to women in Scotland, but also across the rest of the UK, and particularly in Northern Ireland, where there are devastating consequences of the way the exemptions operate, and um, where there's mandatory reporting of serious crimes such as rape to the police, um, and where there is um, exceptionally limited access to abortion health care. Um, so incredibly difficult decisions to be made by the women of Northern Ireland, who of course would not be assisted at all by any mitigation that was um, Scotland specific. Um, we, of course, would judiciously consider the use of any um, of our members' money, which is what we would be using um, to, to seek judicial review, and would obviously um, wish to, to, to spend as little as possible in achieving our um, policy ambitions. So, yes. Anyone else want to come back on that one before I bring Gordon Lindhurst in? No? Gordon. Thanks for that. Um, thank you, Convener. Um, just to bring the, the questions back to Scotland. Um, if I understand you correctly, certainly, Emma Rich, you say that the whole issue and the issues that arise are being considered against the background of other other matters and consideration and how the Scottish Government takes things forward. Um, it's always easy to criticise a policy of, of whatever type. It's much more difficult to actually give an answer which provides a better way forward. And I'm just wanting to know from each of you that your organisations will be providing specific proposals to the Scottish Government as how to approach this matter in the context of the social security system in Scotland, which of course uh, is now and will increasingly perhaps um, differ from that in England. I mean, I hope I can provide reassurance on that point. Um, Engenda has been coordinating a coalition of women's organisations that have been working on social security for a number of years now in Scotland. Um, we have um, been um, vigorously critical um, of some of the implementation of social security in Scotland um, and what we see as weaknesses in, in gender mainstreaming within that. We will continue, we hope, to be challenging um, to Scottish Government as it develops its proposals for the use of devolved um, social security powers um, and would be commenting in um, great detail on the bill and engaging in all of the consultation processes available to us to achieve that. Rob, did you want to come in or Joe in that particular yeah, I mean, I would echo what I said, we've obviously been partnering with Engender and other women's organisations over the last few years on providing evidence to this committee as well as reporting on our concerns about how social security has been implemented um, in Scotland um, and in particular campaigning vigorously on the need for split payments for universal credit um, as a means of ensuring women's financial independence and we'll continue to do that until um, it's, it's actually happening for women in Scotland. Thank you. Did you want to comment on that, Rob, before I bring George Adam? Yeah, I'd um, say that, um, that Cass is taking um, like here, a, sort of a, a very substantial amount of, um, um, amount of work on the, on the new social security system. Um, you can see that it's um, a sort of an opportunity to, um, up from South and Scratch, we've done, done um, a substantial amount of, of engagement with CAB clients, um, advisors, um, have submitted um, extensive evidence to the Scottish Government's consultation, and sort of issued with them on a on a very regular basis about about sort of details of of the new system. Um, so um, so it's it's um, sort of one of our, our sort of biggest sort of policy priorities over the over the next the next year. Thank you. Just a slight small very, one then, because I want... Yeah, yeah, just a very quick follow-up on that. So have you got uh, draft uh, proposals in relation to this particular issue um, that you have provided to the Scottish <laughs> Government at this point for an alternative, or is it, as I understood Emma Rich, to say something that you're looking at in the overall picture rather than saying uh, the best way is to respond to this particular issue that you're here to talk about today? 
Um, so, um, I, I suppose I'd refer back to my answer to Adam Tompkins and, and say that the question of how best to respond to what ultimately happens with this policy, and we don't yet know the outcome. There are a number of conversations which the Minister has obviously been engaged in. Um, once the outcome of that is known, then we will be able more effectively, I think, to say what we think Scottish Government should use its resource um, in implementing the new social security powers. Um, and to do that, we will work with um, academics in institutions in Scotland to do modelling, micro-simulation. Um, we've been involved in expert groups looking at some of the detailed entitlements um, within the new social security system. Um, we'll be contributing to discussions about the establishment of the agency. So we will be bringing detailed proposals, as detailed as, as we can with our capacity, um, forward when the time is right. But at the moment, um, we wouldn't want to comment on this policy in a vacuum with regards to, to mitigation. Okay. Thank you. Is that okay? Well, okay? George Adams, you wanted to come in? Yes, thank you, Kavina, and good morning. Uh, it's been I've really enjoyed listening to some of the evidence you've given. Sometimes when you're in this place, you, you end up thinking you get to a stage where you think you've heard absolutely everything. But when you hear a Tory member sit here saying that third sector organisations should run to the courts to try and sort legislation, then you have to ask yourself, you know, what kind of place are we working in here and what kind of environment? When at the end of the day, would you not think it would actually be the case, a better idea for an organisation like yourself, third sector organisations, to actually spend your members' money and actually other things and actually trying to mend Tory policies in Westminster. But my main question, because all we seem to get here is the fact that is, uh, from the opposition is to either litigate and mi or mitigate. That seems to be OK if you're a lawyer, and many of the Tory benches are lawyers, so you know that's maybe good for them in their profession. But one of the things I would like to ask is, let's get the policy right. Let's try and get something sorted. Let's do it the proper way and actually try and get the policy correct. Now, we know this policy is immoral the way it has at the moment, but one of the things that Engender said, and I think it was my colleague Ben McPherson that brought it up, was the fact that in America, some of the states when they went down this route, uh, Emma, and they decided that they would have a family cap, many of them moved away from it eventually. And not only did they move away from it, they actually found it got people into further poverty, but also at the same time, you know, the, would it not be the case that we would find ourselves in a similar situation? That we've basically got a policy here coming from the UK government, which is actually going to uh, lead to failure anyway, because it doesn't actually make any difference to what it's trying to achieve in the first place. I don't know who wants to respond mm. to that particular one. Yeah, I mean, I, I, th I think a, a point I would w wish to re-emphasise is that um, a quality impact assessment is absolutely critical to the development of complex policy, all policy, but particularly complex um, policy such as social security policy. And I do think some of the profound weaknesses in the thinking underpinning the two-child limit would have been brought to the surface if that process had been undertaken um, with any kind of adequacy. Um, so I think that's, that's vitally important um, to get policy right at the start rather than than to be um, seeking to either mitigate it or um, to challenge it in ways that, that become quite difficult. I mean, I think le there, are, there is virtue to, to legal certainty, so I wouldn't want to rule that, um, that kind of approach out for organisations um, such as mine on every, every single topic. Um, but certainly um, collaboration, um, participatory approaches to developing policy, hearing from women's lived experience, I think would have m produced a, a dramatically um, different kind of policy and I would urge this committee um, to consider all of those approaches when looking at um, the development of the new social security approaches that Scotland will be taking so that it can avoid some of these mistakes in analysis um, and thinking um, at, that um, colleagues perhaps have, have had down south. Anyone else from the panel want to make a comment to Mr Adams' question? Yeah, uh, I, mean, I think as a um, as I said earlier on, it's, um, welcome changes, regardless of, of whichever route they, um, whichever route they, they came from. Um, but um, that I mean, we've um, see we've asked the the UK government to, to reconsider the policy in light of of the evidence from from ourselves and from other organisations. Um, and I think that that would be see the most um, 
the most straightforward step to um, to changing policy um, in terms of um, it sort of how how it comes about and what what tactics people people might use. It's um, that's sort of not um, sort of ne not necessarily for um, for me to say. All I can say is that um, that we vent our evidence and um, and hope that that people act on it. Could I just come in, sorry, Mr. Adam, on that particular point, uh, uh, Rob? Uh, you mentioned the fact that, to, on behalf of the people that you see in CAB, you would prefer this to be scrapped altogether, yes. this policy. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Just, just to make that kind of clear for, for the record, that yep. uh, you've made submissions that this mm. should be scrapped altogether. Yeah, ask the UK government to yeah. reconsider it. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, Ruth McGuire and Richard Leonard. Good morning, panel. Thanks for thanks for being here and for all your evidence and your work. Um, we know that the two-child limit applies to child tax credit and universal credit, but many folk won't know that other forms of income to support children, like um, income support and job seekers allowance, have also been amended to prevent an amount being paid for the third child for sixth from the sixth of April. Even housing benefit regulations have been changed to prevent. Um, the effect of the policy from being offset by additional entitlement to housing benefit. Is this something that um, the panel recognises and what impact do you see from cutting off such vital income streams? Um, as I was uh, um, leading to earlier, it's, it's, it's still, I suppose, slightly unknown what the, what the exact impact will be because it, it is a complex picture that it may change entitlement to to other benefits, not just child tax credits or universal credit. Um, in terms of when when changes like this tend to happen, um, sometimes the the impact um, in on the ground in, in citizens' advice bureaus is, is quite is quite subtle. Um, what they can tend to find over the long time is that so that's an increasing amount of people people struggling to to pay for. For, for essentials and needing um, and needing support from um, from whatever social security support they can get, um, we've seen um, um, as um, if we've met for an, an increased number of people um, who um, been seeking food bank referrals over over the past um, the past three or four years. Um, so it's um, it's something that I think probably we'll, we'll sort of see. Potentially see the impacts as it as it comes in, but that might be might be in the form of, of people people who are struggling and um, um, difficult to get um, get suitable social security entitlement to, to sort of cover their um, cover all their costs. And I want to come in on that, Joe. Then sorry, it's still obviously these, this is still evolving um, in terms of um, our being able to collect evidence from our members on the impact. Um, but we know that women's aid groups are having to try and cobble together destitution funds to be able to supplement women coming in who've, who can't afford to buy nappies for their child or formula milk. Um, all of these things are, are because of the cumulative impact of cuts that women are experiencing and their inability to manage day-to-day -to -day living, really. So, I mean, we'll be continuing to do that with our members to, to be... Um, be, as this develops, to be gathering evidence from them directly and case studies um, of their experiences. Emma, did you want to come in? Yeah, the, the, the Women's Budget Group has um, come to a, to, to a determination that 86% of all of the cuts made in the decade of austerity between 2010 and 2020 will come from women's purses, um, which is a, a staggering figure um, and repeated in work that's been done in the, the House of Commons Library and, and other places also. Um, successive UN committees, when they've been looking at the UK's performance against its international obligations, have required the UK to undertake what's called a cumulative impact assessment. So to look at um, the combined impact of all of these different policy changes um, on um, disabled people, black and minority ethnic people, and on women and children. Um, and so far, those calls have not resulted in any action. Um, and I 
I think we would um, join the Equality and Human Rights Commission, which has repeatedly urged the UK government to, to do that also, because we we simply don't know. Um, we can pull together all our evidence and say um, that these things collectively will be having a de detrimental impact. We can see from indicators such as um, food bank use increasing that real people and real communities are being very seriously affected um, by the withdrawal of services and of income. Um, but the UK is not um, holistically looking at the picture that is being um, painted by its social security reforms and is instead increasing and sustaining the severity of those. Again? I think if, if, if we're at a point where um, women are having to come and be given nappies for their children and, and milk to feed them, it strikes me as cruel, um, the, the, the change to policy. Just really quickly, um, convener, if I might, Scottish Women's Aid, um, within your evidence, there's a, there's a case study which I think um, sets out quite starkly the impact, but probably more over than that, it um, reflects how lacking in a, a, a grounding of what people's lives are like this policy is. Would that be reflected across the client base that um, you work with? I know you, yeah. It certainly is for, I mean, I think it's a very typical sort of example of the case studies that we gather um, in terms of women only be able to access low, largely low-paid employment, temporary employment, juggling that with childcare um, and school holidays and um, other care of elderly parents. Um, and because for women who've experienced domestic abuse, they've often been prevented from working um, um, outside the home um, or to or educational opportunities. So um, they're really they're they're likely to be experiencing more inherent poverty um, and financial and, and risk of, an, of the sort of increased poverty than than other lone parents even so okay. <clears throat> anyone else want to come in, in that answer in that respect okay. I'll bring in Richard Leonard in uh, thanks very much convener um um, I suppose the court of public opinion will uh, uh, be a test in two weeks' time, and uh, people may well pass judgment on this policy amongst amongst others. And uh, I have to say, the geographical exclusion I would like to see is for the whole of the UK to reject this uh, reject this policy. Can I can I come to the, uh, the the cost of it? Because it seems to me that we've we've seen uh, uh, different figures. Um, I think the uh, Minister for Social Security spoke about a £12 billion saving at a UK level. Uh, we've seen figures of £1.5 billion saved per annum across the UK and £85 million saved across Scotland uh, if this uh, policy is applied. Um, I mean, do you get a sense, looking at things in the round, do you get a sense of uh, where those savings uh, are going to be reapplied? Uh, are they going to be reapplied to help the poorest in society? Or do you think they're going to be reapplied to afford tax cuts to those who are better off? Is there an election on, Richard? <laughs> um, I mean, where the UK government chooses to... Um, to sort of um, sort of spend its its savings, or um, well, it's a is a matter for the I suppose the UK government rather than rather than citizens of Ice Scotland. Um, one thing that is worth pointing out is that when um, sort of we talk about wel welfare savings, that it doesn't necessarily um, mean that that the taxpayer is saved money in the long term. This impacts on um, on the health service, on housing. Um, on crisis support and local authorities um, where um, people um, people are struggling to to get by so facing um, constant stress and worry um, so it's it's not necessarily that um, that money would be would be entirely entirely saved it would be um, somewhere else and um, and as the the kind of the the Sheffield Hallam University reports for for this committee of um, um, have highlighted there's there's money that's lost to to the the economy in local areas so it's i think it's probably more of a i suppose a, a sort of a complex pitch than than merely sort of making making a saving that um that's safe to the um safe to the public purse emma or george you want to come in on that particular one okay richard do you want to come back in again 
Uh, no, no, that's, that's, that's fine. I mean, I, I mean, as advocacy organisations, I would have thought you may have a view mm -hmm. uh, on the, uh, the distribution of uh, resources in society. Okay. Could I just ask that I've already asked Rob, and uh, for the benefit of the committee and the evidence we've heard, uh, your organisations, would you prefer to see this uh, so-called legislation scrapped completely? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I'll call the meeting to a close just now, and thank you very much for, for your evidence, and we'll give a few minutes to the witnesses to change over. Thank you so much. And uh, I just want to welcome today and thank you very much for your written evidence also. It was very, very helpful for the committee. Uh, just welcome John Dickey, Director of Child Poverty Action Group in Scotland, and Devin Galani, if I've got it pronounced properly, Director of Policy and Practice. Uh, welcome. Uh, I'll start off with, with a, a basic question that picked up from the previous witnesses. And one of the, the issues which uh, they, they replied to one of my questions is with regard to the legislation and how it will have a knock-on effect uh, and any other benefits, as you may call that, even such as school meals and school clothing grants. So my question to the witnesses is, uh, how will that affect, uh, for John Dickey and the role that you play in the child poverty, how will that affect children already living in poverty? And also, how could that policy be implemented in that respect? So I'll open it up to, to the witnesses. Let's go. Shall I start? Mm -hmm. OK. So starting yeah. off initially at a high level, uh, I guess our analysis um, looked at just tried to effectively evaluate the policy on its own terms. I think we've, we've talked a lot about um, just using numbers to look at whether or not it's meeting its objectives uh, as originally set out, which are twofold. One is changing behaviour, and the second one is saving money, uh, effectively. In terms of responding to that particular question, what impact will it have? Um, specifically, it affects about a quarter of a million people who are already in poverty today, uh, pushing them uh, deeper, and deeper into poverty. Uh, just over a quarter of a million who um, are a little bit of, ever so slightly, a uh, quarter of a million children, sorry, a quarter of a million children who are currently above the poverty line who will move below. This is from a UK perspective. I was trying to do the numbers specifically for Scotland. I think it's uh, it was tough on the plane. Um, and then 600,000 children who are above the poverty line will remain above the poverty line but will be worse off. And that's looking at the children who are um, born and won't be receiving that support, but also their siblings too because, again, this by, by default affects larger families. Um, the knock-on impacts on other benefits um, does exist. Um, it is, relative to other reforms that are happening at the same time, relatively slight. Um, but the complexity of putting all of these, looking at, uh, I guess, the cumulative impact of welfare reform and looking at the, the combined impact of all of these welfare reforms together is effectively what policy and practice do, because I think that's what, um, what affects people. At the end of the day, that's what affects the families. You know, they're not. This particular policy will have an impact on specific families, but really they're interested in the combined impact of this, the benefit cap, universal credit, other things that are coming in that ultimately affect their ability to, to meet their spending commitments. 
John. Yes, I mean, I suppose, like Devon, our focus has been on the overall impact of this particular policy on levels of child poverty, and I can go into that in a bit more depth in terms of those knock-on effects that you were talking about. Um, uh, done less work in terms of actually working out what where the risks are for particularly for devolved um, benefits like school clothing grants or, or, or free school meals. Um, I think we've already had commitment from Scottish government that it won't impact on council tax reduction, and I think we need to see make sure that there's similar um, arrangements in place. That to just because you're uh, a third child in a family and uh, uh, losing entitlement to UK child tax credit or universal credit. That you're not um, that that's not having an impact on passported benefits. So there is a, there's a, a job to, to check, check through that. Um, I just wanted to explore it a bit. Obviously, we're looking at that and open up to questions. I mean, I remember the stigma attached to uh, children getting free school meals when you had a different ticket from everyone else, uh, and the evidence we were given there you would need to fill in a form. Would it possibly take? Um, okay. We're talking about Scotland here, but it's a UK-wide policy. Is that the kind of form it could possibly take, that people would begin back to having a stigma for school grants or uh, free school meals? I hope not. Now, I need to go back and look at that in more depth to see how, how we can ensure that in Scotland, um, loss of entitlement if you, for third and subsequent children doesn't lead to any administrative barriers to claiming devolved social security uh, or devolved benefits like free school meals or school clothing grants. Um, I think there's actually good work going on anyway in terms of removing um, the need for uh, application. Uh, so, for example, in Glasgow are looking at automatic, automat automaticising uh, entitlement to school clothing grant and now uh, to, to free school meals using uh, data that they already have about people's uh, financial support, but making sure that that happens in a way that uh, doesn't just feed through the loss of universal credit, child tax credit, uh, and, and that impact on uh, free school meal entitlement is something that we need to look at. David, would you have any thoughts on that particular? Because it is a UK, you know, wide uh, legislation. Do you have any thoughts on that? Would, would that be the effect it may have in people? So, think, before getting so, so rather than the stigma, I think if you think about some of the specific interactions that this policy will have, which I think was your first question really on the knock-on implications for other benefits, um, there are a couple that come to mind. So first, the first one is that again that commitment to um, ensuring household the, the council tax support isn't affected by this reform is relatively straightforward in the context of the current method of assessing um, council tax support. Uh, under universal credit, that does get that, there's a strong chance that that gets more complex. Um, we've modelled council tax support schemes for 40 local authorities across the UK, many of which have now been implemented. Um, and there are some interesting drivers in a universal credit context, uh, particularly given the high administrative cost of administering council tax support, that makes it, uh, will make it more difficult to meet that same commitment under universal credit. Um, there are a couple of other uh, sort of potential short-term knock-on consequences, but I think the longer-term impacts as well on take-up of other benefits is relevant too. So um, in, in some respects, it can actually increase uh, the demand and requirement for some, some types of uh, later down the line anti-poverty measures, so things like uh, the, the take-up eligibility for free school meals. Um, you mentioned the school clothing grant. We looked at, at a couple of others, so things like the pupil premium policy. Um, depending on what the, the future eligibility criteria for those types of policy are, um, if children are worse off uh, effectively at the outset, the take-up of some of these other later down the line costs for government are likely to increase. Thank you very much. I've got uh, Ruth, you wanted to come in and Alison. Thanks, convener. Good morning, panel. Um, in written evidence, um, I think it was from Child Poverty Action Group, um, you mentioned that the coalition government estimated in 2010 that as many as 350,000 um, children and 500,000 working adults could be moved out of poverty by these changes, and that was referring to universal credits introduction um, by virtue of the changes to entitlement and increased take-up of benefits. Um, this clearly hasn't been the case. Could you elaborate on the difference um, that you see now between between now and the 2010 estimate and you know what's what's actually happening um, and by how much was the UK government wrong in its estimations? The original modelling was that universal credit in itself would reduce child poverty by 350,000 across the UK um, by 2020. Um, that was against a backdrop of a whole series of other cuts to the financial support to families, freezing of 
uh, freezing of operating, cuts to child benefit, cuts to uh, um, other sources of financial support. But in itself, it, uh, it, on, on paper, the, the model was that it would reduce child poverty. Um, the current, we've looked at in terms of what the actual the actual um, impact on child poverty will be by the, the, the uh, in terms of universal credit, and it's now looking like there'll be a million more children in, in poverty by 2020. Um, so clearly a massive <laughs> difference in terms of the impact uh, of universal credit. That's not just about the two-child limit, that's about the wider cuts that have been made to, uh, uh, to, to universal credit. So changes to um, work allowances within universal credit, changes to the taper rate at which um, universal credit um, is, is withdrawn as people increase their uh, into work and increase their earnings, a whole series of cuts to the value of universal credit that uh, is reducing its poverty, uh, its poverty, poverty <coughs> fighting potential. Um, and I suppose our key focus at the moment is to try and t to fix that and get UK government. You know, this is being ruled out now, but it can be it can be fixed. You can invest in it to ensure that it has more of that poverty fighting potential that it had when it was originally designed. And Devon was, uh, you know, we have more to say about in terms of how the original design um, w worked and how, how that would impact on levels of child poverty. But there's been a clear um, what was in principle uh, would have had a poverty reducing impact uh, is now. Um, you know, very, in terms of uh, modelling that IPPR done, analysis we've done uh, is, is now um, uh, you know, going to actually increase levels of poverty. And the um, OBR itself uh, has also acknowledged that its overall universal credit regime uh, will be less generous than the system that it's replacing. Yeah, so I mean, for those that are unaware, I was part of the team that developed universal credit as a policy concept at the Centre for Social Justice. Um, initially, I think the, uh, and perhaps still, the, the concept behind simplifying the benefit system and ensuring people are better off in work um, hopefully still has broad cross party support. The way in which I think it's sensible to think about universal credit is in two ways. So, one is that, that, that aim of changing the structure of the system and how that works, and the second one is how much money we spend on the system, both in terms of the out-of-work support and the levels of in-work support and how they're tapered off. Um, from my perspective, I think reducing the levels of in-work support to be less generous than they are under the current benefit system is probably a step backwards for a government that um, implemented universal credit on the basis of making work pay. Um, and that's probably, you know, fiscal constraints aside, uh, still a, uh, a trade-off choice between other spending decisions elsewhere. Um, I'd also say, but I would also say that kind of, from my perspective, the policy concept behind universal credit of simplifying the benefit system and ensuring that people can be, can uh, clearly and conceptually see that they would always be better off in work and working more still stands. Um, and the policy and practice do an awful lot of work on looking at the looking at the practical elements of implementing universal credit too and we see part of our role as uh taking the, the practical voice of the organizations we work with housing associations local authorities and others on the front line and feeding them back into the policy process um to try and implement where where the where the starting point is a, is a policy issue trying to iron those out um and sometimes where it's an implementation issue working with officials to try and find a constructive route through that do you want to come back in Alison, you wanted to come in and then. Thank you, convener, and thank you both, and particularly for your written submissions. I think um, I'm very concerned by the evidence that, that we're hearing um, that once universal credit is ruled out, uh, the two-child limit will result in another 200,000 children being pushed into poverty in the UK. That's obviously gravely concerning. And um, the Child Poverty Action Group, you say in your written submission that 51,000 families across Scotland with more than two children claimed tax credits in 2014-15. And you make the point that 39% of children and families with more than three children live in poverty compared to 26% with two children. So what, what I feel, and I, th I think policy and practice, you touch on this too, is that we're seeing a corruption of our needs-based system. I think policy and practice, you make the point that we're moving away from the needs-based principles on which the British welfare you know, system w was set up. Um, it seems that we're assessing needs, recognising it, and then saying, well, do you know what? That's just tough because you don't meet these criteria. Um, do, you, do you agree with that characterisation? Is there anything that we can do to 
to stop what I see as, as the rot that's beginning to set in. I mean, it's, it's not just corrupting, it's, break, it's breaking the link. Clearly, the, the, the two-child limit breaks the link between the needs of a family and a child for additional financial support and the level of support that's going to be made available through the social security system. So there's a, a breaking of that, and that's one of the most invidious aspects, I suppose, of this of this policy, is, 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 is that break. Um, I suppose what concerns us uh, is the kind of mismatch, the dis disconnect between the, um, the apparent policy objective of the, the two-child limit and the actual practicality of how it plays out. Um, so the explanation given to it is meant to introduce some fairness between working families and those who aren't working, that it's meant to uh, make parents um, think carefully about whether they can uh, afford to uh, bring up a, a child, um, is, is at, at odds with the reality of who, <laughs> the bulk of people who are going to be impacted by the policy. So you're, you're absolutely two, two thirds of the families um, who are going to be impacted this uh, are, are families who are working um, and two thirds of them are families who, where there's only three children. So we're not talking about huge families, we're talking about families with three children and, and two, -thirds of fa two thirds of those families affected being um, families uh, who are in work. So it's hard to see how that's creating fairness between working and non-working families if, if any such unfairness exists at the moment and we would question that at all. And the other assumption that is based on that somehow um, families um, can plan on the basis of absolute financial security for the 18 years that it takes to bring up a, a, a child. I mean, very few, if any, families are in that position uh, and no family that I'm aware of can guarantee that it's not going to be impacted by uh, unemployment, by redundancy, by ill health, um, or by widowhood, by widowhood, or by separation. You know, these are all things that can happen over the course of a, a life, of a child growing up, and um, that have a significant impact on family incomes. That I'm not quite sure how families are meant to to to, to plan. I mean, it's just not not possible to plan for that. And then to have a, a social security system that fails, that is now, if if, if this continues to operate, um, fails to uh, provide support on the basis of need when one of those. Uh, uh, sources of financial insecurity hit a family. Um, you know, this seems to be a, a, a real, um, you know, an undermining of what we mean by social security, or what social security should be able to provide for families uh, in, across in Scotland and across the UK. So I'm sure the session will move on to on, on to ways forward. And I wanted to answer this question in a way that sort of hopefully got us all thinking about about that. So. Um, Yes, it is a shift away from the needs-based, some, some of those needs-based principles. But I think it's worth thinking about how we assess and think about needs. Um, so I say that for two reasons. One, partly you know, the, the, the driver by how, how poverty is currently measured based on income means that if you take money out of the system, clearly more people will be in poverty in the same way that if you put money into the system, fewer people will be in poverty. I think there is a more sophisticated, you know, going by the relative income definition, I think there's a more sophisticated way of thinking about poverty. Um, so we've done some work for a number of authorities, again, who to to model the expected expenditure of different households based on uh, uh, different different size levels. And certain authorities have been able to use that to identify households that are those that are coping versus those that are struggling, versus those that are at risk and, and those that are actually in crisis. Again, when you're trying to intervene and work with households, you often have contact with those that are in crisis. They're the ones that they're generally the households that are more likely to present. Um, it would be interesting to see what level of intervention could happen with households that were um, had gone from struggling to being at risk. So actually, you know, there, there's potentially a concern there and that there's an opportunity to intervene. The way in which we go about doing that, and the reason I wanted to sort of mention it is because with um, hopefully some of the powers that Scotland will have, thinking about new ways of uh, developing a social security system that gets the right kind of support to the right people at the right time is is something that's worthwhile yeah is, is worthwhile putting a, a lot of energy into and it's it's probably a step away from um simple mitigation do you believe that the cost of this policy will ultimately fall on the children affected i mean i think um just to we did a couple of bits of analysis and if you if you look at where um if you look at where so the arguments the government made for ring fencing certain aspects of social security, particularly those for older people um, and those for people of working age, I think the driver behind that has been older people 
do not necessarily have the ability to do anything to change their current circumstances, and, and that's one of the drivers for, one of the justifications for, for protection. I would apply that same argument to the children who are affected by this policy, both the babies that are born into these families and their siblings, of, of how much ability they had to necessarily influence that. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't fundamentally do, you know, perhaps that doesn't mean that you shouldn't do anything about it. There are, if the objective is to save money, you could save money by reducing the level, you know, there are other policy alternatives depending on what the policy objective is. Um, I think that's where our concerns uh, stem from. I mean, yes, I mean, you can't, you know, modelling the impact of this policy without the two-child limit, uh, and then with the two-child limit, 200,000 more children in poverty across the UK. And I hope the evidence we've previously given to this committee about what the impact of uh, growing up in poverty, growing up in an income that's so far behind um, what is the, the, the norm in our society and what is needed to provide a decent start in life for children, that comes at a cost. And it comes at a cost in terms of all the evidence that we've presented previously to Department in terms of people, children's education, their health, their well-being. You can't um, drive um, children into poverty, increase levels of child poverty without significant impacts on children's well-being and actually significant costs for all of us as society and significant costs as the Devon and previous uh, uh, panels flagged up in terms of other public services. God, oh, sorry. Gordon Lynn, has you wanted to come in a quick supplementary yeah. on that one? Um, a question really for Devon Galeni. Um, you referred to this being a step backwards against the background of considerations relating to the idea being it should be, I think, pay more to be in work than out of work, the government policy and so forth. Um, now, I'm not suggesting other considerations are not also important, but, uh, and I think you mentioned in the, the written submission to the committee as well, this aspect of that. Have you done calculations purely on that sort of financial um, aspect to demonstrate the value or lack of value of this particular um, alteration in the tax credit system? And is there a tipping point where, even from a purely financial point of view, you could show that it it's either worth it or not worth it? I'm not sure how to frame it, but um, just interested in your thoughts on that, developing on your earlier point. Uh, you know that we have a minute silence at 11 o'clock. Ah, uh, yes, yes it was announced earlier. I mean, you may start... I will stop, yeah. ...in answer to say, or, yep, OK, on you go. Yeah, so I'll, I'll kick off with a response. I, hopefully it won't take five minutes, we'll see. Mm -hmm. um, uh, no, but it's a very good point. Um, so, so I think it's, it's worthwhile raising. We have done... Uh, so the modelling we do is, again, that cumulative impact assessment that I think others have mentioned before, and I think the, the Parliament has commissioned. The, the, the driver behind policy and practice a, a approach to this, as well as modelling all reforms combined, including things like uh, mitigating measures like increases in the national minimum wage the, and uh, of the personal tax allowance in the context of this and universal credit and everything else that could potentially be coming in, is also the, um, uh, the ability to effectively do this at the individual household level. So when these analyses are typically done, you look at them using sample data, the Family Resources Survey, or other large-scale data sets that exist. Our work has primarily been working with local authorities' own administrative data, anonymised, um, and working with, yeah, effectively working with that to track the impact that these policies are having on individual households. Uh, and because you're tracking these individual households over time, you can start to see causation uh, between one policy and the next. So. We've done this, um, I think this is very relevant to Scotland, which is why I bring it up. We've done this in London, whereby we've managed to pull together data across 14 London boroughs over the last, well, what we'll be pulling it together over two years. That's 450,000, more than 450,000 low-income households with individual data points at each month. And some of the conclusions that's allowed us to, some of the questions, that, you know, more analysis tends to lead, lead to more questions at times. But some of the, the, the things that that's, that sort of pointed us toward is, um, so we were asked to look at, for example, the cost of temporary accommodation when impacted by a particular benefit reform, specifically the benefit cap. And what we found was that 80% of households had been in temporary accommodation for more, more than the last 12 months. So, we, so putting those aside, for those 20% that had moved into temporary accommodation, um, we really now have to ask the question of, 
are they affected by the benefit cap because they're in temporary accommodation and the cost of temporary accommodation are higher? Or were they affected by the benefit cap and that drove them to leave a tenancy and move into temporary accommodation? These are questions that we're now able to, able to answer. Um, the other way in which some of this work can happen is in, is in targeting discretionary support. So I think from reading other submissions, discretionary, dis discretionary mitigation is one route forward for families affected by this. I think there are some serious administrative challenges, both in terms of the cost of administration, but more importantly in terms of getting support to the families that are actually affected. Um, that, is, that, is, that is a challenge without being able to pinpoint individual households. Um, I think this is, for policy and practice, this is a very powerful and important way forward to think about how we address these broader questions of social security. So the ability to model policy all the way through to 2020, so the crux of your question is, have we done this modeling? Yes, um, taking into account all of these reforms together, but also modeling multiple scenarios through to 2020. So we, there's a pre-Brexit pre and a post-Brexit scenario um, looking at um, differences in uh, increases in wages, for example, or increases in rent levels. I'll, I'll pause there and happy to take a supplementary, but I think we're close to 11. One last point in the last 20 seconds, though, is I think the other reason it's relevant to mention here is I think data and information has been very powerful in influencing Westminster. So when I look at the local authorities' successes they've had, uh, those have typically come with local authorities that know how to use and wield the power of information. That I think we all benefit from that minute's silence and our, our own private thoughts. Uh, could I just continue, obviously, the discussion? Uh, Gordon Lindhurst, did you want to come back in again on that? And then Polly yeah, McNeil? Just, just very briefly, convener, thank you. Um, so, in relation to this specific issue of the child tax um, credit cap, um, it, it may be there's not been the time or opportunity to do these sorts of uh, calculations or broad considerations yet. Will you be undertaking these? So we've done this for a number of individual local authorities. So, mm -hmm. for example, for Croydon, their ability now to pinpoint households with two children that could potentially be affected um, now exists. Uh, and the next step for them is to tie that into information around, potentially information around life births, and there are obviously a lot of uh, other consider administrative considerations around things like that. But that's the way in which this kind of information, uh, the use of this kind of information could potentially be applied. Um, similarly, again, if it was around mitigation, where a third child was born and notified, uh, notified the relevant authorities, um, you could then immediately target mitigation to that household. Okay. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Paula McNeil. Yeah, thank you. Um, I found what you said very interesting, so I'm going to switch my questions to get a wee bit deeper into what you've said. Um, 
of course, um, there was a point where we didn't have child tax credit. A Labour government introduced it. It's something I would wish to continue to defend. I believe in it. I believe it has reduced uh, poverty across Britain. But the context we live in now, as you previously mentioned, a financial crash where people lost their jobs, where poor, more people went, you know, fell into poverty. And Brexit is obviously, it has to be a factor in all of this, so more families will be in poverty. Um, so it's hard to make assumptions because the, the objective of the policy is to get people to think about planning their families if the state is paying. Of course, they may ignore that and continue to do it anyway, have more children, even though that's not supported by the state. So, so what, you were, what you were telling the committee about trying to identify those families who are uh, struggling against those families who are coping, I think is quite important um, evidence. Um, and I recognise what you're saying. It's what we've listened to already about the role of local authorities, crucial work of local authorities in tackling poverty. But of course, they can only do that if there's, you know, an increase in, in the resource to do that. Um, is it your view then that, that this should be addressed in terms of government policy? If the government of the day, whoever they happen to be, are not going to reverse the policy itself on only supporting two children, with obviously some exceptions. Are you suggesting that there should be uh, an argument made to the the government, the UK government, that there should be some other way of recognising that the policy might have quite a dramatic effect years down the line and there should be some way of recognising how then the policy could be adjusted? So I think we need to think about this policy in two ways, uh, you know, effectively that point in two ways. So the first is um, how do we how do we use information and analysis around this to influence at a strategic policy level, um, and how might, might we use it to once a strategic policy direction has been determined to make better operational choices? So I think there are two ways of looking at it, and I work with local authorities effectively, local policy, local strategy, but also local operational uh, decisions. I think at a broader level, you could ask some quite important questions about this particular policy. For example, is the causal impact on fertility rates evident? You know, you can easily compare whether, you know, the likelihood of, um, uh, yeah, changes in fertility, fertility rates between two different groups of families, those that were affected by this policy and those that weren't, for example. Um, these, are, these are things that can now be, these are questions that can now be answered. Um, whose role it is to ask and answer these questions. I think there's some, some relevant points being made in the first session about impact assessments and how in-depth and how detailed they should be. But fundamentally, I think um, it's also a, it's, it's a relevant responsibility for everyone who's concerned about, about, these, about these choices. And equally, at an operational level too, um, you know, perhaps that's not the place for this, for this committee, but I do think uh, you know, I, I agree with, with the point made that local authorities do an awful lot of important work in getting the right kind of support to particularly the most vulnerable families and the ways in which they're using information to show whether or not their interventions are effective or not is, is very relevant and useful to themselves and their future direction but also other local authorities and the development of best practice. Did you want to come in? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's coming I think there's a real role for local authorities, both in terms of this uh, change to the social security system, this, this cut, uh, but also others in terms of identifying those households that are affected and doing all that they can within their powers to um, support those families. I'm a bit concerned we're moving away from the fundamental problem here, which is the two-child limit. Um, now, we have a range of evidence of uh, Ellen's <laughs> policy and practice, quarter of a million ch more children in poverty by the end of the decade, the IPPR CPAG analysis, 200,000 more children into poverty by the end of the decade using a different methodology. We've got the Institute for Fiscal Studies, 200,000 more children in poverty as a direct result of the two-child limit. The focus needs to be on repealing the two-child limit uh, and um, doing all that we can to ensure that the, UK, the next UK government does that. Um, and I suppose that's, I suppose that's a key, key point I was wanting to make that. And, and I suppose in terms of these other dynamic uh, effects in terms of some of the suggestions as to why this policy is there to uh, encourage um, parents to, be, to, to, to plan more, uh, to encourage uh, uh, them to have fewer children or whatever. Um, I think we heard in the first panel evidence from the US 
very, you know, very small, if any, effect on fertility and the number of children low-income families were having. The UK government's own impact assessment doesn't attempt, attempt to incorporate any such effect, uh, saying that they are uncertain. So this is this is the policy is coming from there. You sort of think rather than us sort of trying to justify or trying to find the evidence that this won't have an impact on um, uh, that it's meant to have. There's no evidence being presented that it will have the impact that it's meant to have, but we have a whole lot of evidence that it's going to have an impact on levels of child poverty. Um, and I think, as Devon earlier or somebody earlier suggested, the IFS um, do suggest that there's some uh, evidence that fertility decisions uh, can be affected by benefit changes, but they're un unable to establish, and I'm quoting, timing effects and, any, and an impact on the total number of children. So it's clearly very limited evidence this will have that kind of impact. Um, so another point I'd make is, is, is encouraging families, those, those, those working families, those or families out of work, whoever they are, but uh, to have fewer children. Is that the policy intent do we want in an in a ageing population? Do, are, we, are we really saying that working families should be having fewer children? Um, so, you know, I, suppose I just want to get back to the fundamentals of this particular policy and why we need to be focusing on repealing it. Not just, sorry, I'm just letting John finish. Can I just say, Pauline, <laughs> um, it's our job to interrogate all the evidence before us, and I'm just interested to hear, uh, we, we, because at the moment I don't see that the current government seemed convinced, even, I mean, I have to say, I, I thought the, the debate we had in the parliament was embarrassing for the current government, but it doesn't seem to have resulted in a policy change. So I'm just, in, I'm just interrogating the idea that if we fail, and who knows what will happen on, on June the 8th, um, we need to come up with, with something. We have to continue. Because um, I, I do believe we're heading for something much bigger. I do believe that there's a, there will be an impact of Brexit on the policy. Um, and, and it would be quite useful to get your evidence on that, that will be an added dimension. We're only uh, months down the line of the implications of Brexit. And I presume that um, there will be, be more families in poverty as a result of it. Would that be your view? I mean, certainly the modelling that uh, was done by PPR for us um, factors in um, the kind of employment rates, kind of uh, tax and benefit uh, modelling based on what we know about um, uh, you know, cost of living, employment rates. So um, I think there is, you know, substantial evidence out there that cost of living is likely to increase, and is already we're seeing that that happening. That clearly, if uh, we see. Um, Benefits more family benefits more widely being frozen and reduced in lots of different ways, then clearly that's going to have an impact in, in, in itself in terms of levels of family poverty. So I, I, I mean, I, I, I take the point. That it is important that we actually look at what we can can do pragmatically as well as um, how we I guess, go about repealing I mean, the policy. I, 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 sorry, just last point. I guess I was taking it down a slightly geeky path of, of kind of data-driven analysis. The, the main point around that fundamentally is how you change policy in Westminster uh, and also how you deliver mitigation in practice operationally can both be very heavily influenced by how you wield this information. Um, a lot of it sits within the local authorities across Scotland. We've done some work with North Ayrshire in the past um, and the example I gave across London shows it is possible, although no mean feat, to pool some of this information together and particularly with the powers that Scotland will have. Um, with the Social Security Bill, how you think about how you implement those in the broader scheme of what's happening to the Social Security system, it's worthwhile thinking about how you use that information to do that um, and to achieve your objectives, which again, for me, it's not quite clear to me whether or not they're to, re to, to influence Westminster and have this sort of national um, bill repealed or whether it's to think about how Scotland can mitigate the impacts. I think in either case, how you actually use the data is slightly different, but it's still relevant. Thank you. Thank you. Ben McPherson and then Adam Tom. Thank you, convener, and thanks both of you for your evidence. In the policy and practice paper, you, you stated, um, do I know, it states that over a million children will be hit by the policy, um, it says, by the end of this parliament, but we'll, we'll take that as the, as the, in, the, in the coming years. Um, and 2.1 million families are at risk of being affected um, should they have another, another child. As well as the, the impact that that will have on the, the well-being of the individuals in, involved and the well-being of our society, 
I wonder, do any of the, the panel members foresee any long-term costs of this two-child limit on the economy specifically, um, particularly given forecasts of, of hundreds of thousands of more children being pushed into poverty as a result, and uh, given that we know that the costs of poverty are significant and that uh, children who grow up in poverty have lower productivity uh, as adults and have a, a higher risk of falling into unemployment. So, uh, work I've done, I've done previously on outcome-based government looks at the costs of policies, both obviously the benefits of policies and the costs of policies in, in three main ways, so fiscal, economic and social. Um, the analysis we did in that paper looked specifically at the fiscal because I think again within its own terms does it save money was a question we were looking to, to ask and I think um, we identified a number of fiscal costs that were going to come into effect to offset that. What we didn't look at alongside it which is why I think it's a very good question are the we didn't sort of model the economic and social implications. I think it's relatively clear to me through common sense that um, again families and we talk about children that are, that are moving into poverty, the children that are already in poverty and where perhaps families are already struggling with um, meeting, their, meeting their obligations around rent and other things, that will have knock-on consequences both on public services but also on the well-being of children in those families and it's very difficult to say exactly what that will be but um, net it's unlikely to be very positive, you know, it's, it's likely to have a negative impact on their um, ability to pay attention in school, I think the evidence points towards all of that. Um, so economic, from, from an economic perspective, then if they're not doing as well in school, I think there are concerns, and we say this policy is likely to have long-term fiscal and social implications well into the future, and I think that's a nod uh, toward some of these un, un fully kind of not fully costed, but quite concerning scenarios as to what happens to the children growing up in those families. Um, at the same time, I think there was a point earlier to say that kind of. I think net spending on social security, the IFS did this modelling, and I'm not sure whether they did it on social security overall or working age social security, is still higher than it was pre tax pre the introduction of tax credits. So I think there's a driver, I saw it in one of the, the, the reading notes here, so I think there's a driver here um, from, the, from the current government and previous government to sort of say actually the benefit system is too generous and they're making calls here as to who should and should not get that support. I think they're valid questions for politicians. Um, whether or not they're being done in the right way can only be really answered against the policy's own objectives, which is why we've looked at this, this policy in the way that we have. And again, if you're trying to influence Westminster is to say, you wanted to achieve this, did you? And the only other point I'm, while, I'm, while I've got the microphone is to say, in the, con in, in the context of behaviour change, really, as well as the evidence that says, will or will this not affect policy, I think it's important to look at how much effort has gone into making people aware of this policy in order to influence their behaviour. Now, again, there's a lot of work we've done around how you make people who are affected by one benefit policy aware of all the others that affect them. Um, so this kind of work is, is entirely possible. Um, but I don't think, and again, if you think about nine months before this policy was introduced, how many families were aware of it? Very, uh, you know, next to none. And I think so. If that's a policy objective, how much effort did you really put toward achieving it? Is a is a valid? These are the kinds of questions that I think um, can be powerful. Do you want to reply to that? I know we're running out of time. I've given you an extra five minutes. Now four just, minutes. This was just in terms of the cost of the policy. We don't have anything specific on what the cost of this specific policy are. We do know that the um, overall loss in to Scottish households of um, cuts to the value of Social Security um, post-2015 cuts a bill, over a billion pounds, 20 to, 20 to 20 to 2015, a billion pounds. Yeah, that's money out of families' pockets in communities across mm. Scotland, uh, that's money not being spent in local businesses and local shops. There's a, a knock-on impact, not just for the families themselves, but for the, for the, for the economy. In terms of the cost of child poverty, um, work done there, um, modelling the, the actual overall cost of child poverty, £29 billion a year uh, in the UK, the cost of both picking up the pieces in terms of additional pressures on education, uh, social services, uh, 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 health and all the rest of it, as well as the, the lost income as a result of having a generation of children um, who are less likely to be in work and less likely to be earning decent wages. So there are big costs to tolerating mm -hmm. a situation and pushing for even more children into poverty. Thank you, Joe. 
Ben, is that you? Oh, Adam Tompkins, you wanted to come Yeah, come please, in. thank you, Kavina. Um, <coughs> given uh, what you said, uh, John, about um, the, the modelling that's been done about the numbers of children that we've pushed into poverty as a result of this, and I, I understand the force of the argument about trying to tackle this at source and its UK policy, not um, Scottish policy. But as you very well know, we have a child poverty bill uh, in front of us uh, at the moment in this in this parliament. This committee has reported on it uh, already, um, and we'll deliberate on it um, uh, next week uh, in the chamber. Is there anything specific in the child poverty bill that we should be thinking about um, uh, strengthening or changing or adding to the bill? Um, you know, with, with with this with this particular policy in in mind. Um, um, you just got that in at the very, very end because it had nothing absolutely to do with what we're talking about. I think what you're trying to say is, yeah, you, you managed to get three words, I think. I think I'm not... What you're actually saying to Mr Dickey is, is there anything from this child poverty, this two-child uh, clause, which could be affecting the child poverty bill? Is that is that correct? I think the way I expressed the question was clearer than the way you well, expressed the question, may, but I'd like may, to hear the answer to We may change, we, we may argue that point, but I think Mr Dickey knows exactly what I'm saying. Uh, John, do you want to come back in that, because we've got about a minute to go for part an about, It's the kind of extension of the mitigation question, I think, is what, what can be done here. I mean, the first thing I'd just uh, again say, I suppose, this is a policy that affects children across the UK. Um, the CPAG, our purpose is to end child poverty across the UK. Um, this, you know, there's, this, this policy is unacceptable whether you're a family uh, living in Liverpool, Carlisle or, or, or Edinburgh, uh, and we will continue to focus in terms of our campaigning work, but also picking up on um, Mr Tompkins' earlier point, um, uh, focus, uh, we're actually challenging this legally as well. We do believe this, is, this policy is un unlawful. Um, our legal officer uh, uh, in London uh, is actively exploring how we bring a, a judicial review uh, and challenge this policies and working with families to uh, actually challenge this policy in the courts and we'll continue to do that and that that I suppose is where our focus is at the moment. Um, well, given a couple of extra minutes you've already said that you're challenging it so I take okay. it that you would wish to scrap this policy throughout absolutely. the UK. Yes, absolutely. It needs to be repealed. Mr Devon I know that you're an academic yeah. would you have any thoughts on that particular one because from where I'm sitting if you're a low paid, you're a woman and you've got more than two children, you're affected. But if you're well off, uh, you can have t as many children as you like, you're not affected by this. So I just see there's a bit of anomalies within this uh, policy. I don't want to put you on the spot, but please, no, you if can. you want. I mean, I guess an interesting point that we haven't really touched on is, is perhaps the idea that this policy is likely to be relatively popular with the electorate. Um, so that suggests that there's something in it that... Um, people like um, and, 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 and that's worth investigating. I, I think for me uh, taking the academic response uh, is, is to look at whether or not the policy is meeting its objectives in its own terms. Um, I think in that context it probably isn't and therefore there's a case to ask the government to reassess. Diplomatically put. Uh, I bring this meeting to an end and we'll now go into private session. Thank you very much.